Hey everybody, welcome to my Real Analysis Exam 2 Review Problems and Solutions video. We're going to go through a bunch of definitions, theorem statements, true-false questions, calculations, and proofs related to limits of functions, continuity, uniform continuity, differentiability, and the basics of Riemann integrability. We start with the definition of the limit of a function. We have a real valued function f defined in what's called a deleted neighborhood u of some point c in R. You can think of u as being an open interval that has c inside except you take c out, you delete c from u. The reason we do this is the function doesn't have to be defined at c for the limit as x approaches c to exist. And that's what we want to define. Define what it means for f to have limit l at c. In other words, what this notation means. I don't want to just give you the answer. I want you to be able to think intuitively about this by drawing a picture and trying to understand what you've learned about that definition. So we can draw a typical kind of looking picture and I'm purposely going to initially at least make f undefined at c but then I will define it later at c to be something other than the second coordinate of that point that is missing here for the purpose of emphasizing something. So this is the graph of my function f. c is this value on the x-axis. L is supposed to be the limiting value of f as x approaches c but does not equal c. So as you let x approach c from the right or left, the second coordinates of the points on the graph are getting closer and closer to the second coordinate of the missing point, so to speak. That coordinate would be L. The intuitive idea is that we can make f, the second coordinates of these points, the outputs of f as close to L as we like by taking x sufficiently close to c but not necessarily equal to c because, for example, this function is undefined at c. The Greek letter epsilon is taken to be the traditional measure of how close to, to L we want to be. This distance right here is supposed to be epsilon and a, a symmetric distance down here is supposed to be epsilon, making this number L plus epsilon and this number L minus epsilon. And the fact that the limit really is L means that we're going to be able to do what we want to do no matter how small this positive distance epsilon is. In this case, delta doesn't have to be very small because there's a wide range of values of x whose outputs are going to be between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon within epsilon of L. We can, for example, take delta to be, say, about this distance here, and that will be fine to go from C minus delta to C plus delta. Any input x in this interval besides c, because again f is undefined at c, will have an output, a second coordinate that is within epsilon of L, and again we can do this no matter how small epsilon is. Let's go ahead and state the definition now. For all epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small, but you don't have to write that in the definition, that's what you're thinking intuitively, there exists another number, delta greater than zero, taken to be sufficiently small, but you don't have to write that, such that I'm going to write the next line in two different ways. One way you can write it is this. The distance between f of x and l, which is the absolute value of f of x minus l, can be made less than epsilon for all x in u within delta of c, which also implicitly means x does not equal c for all x in u such that the distance between x and c is less than delta. And by saying x is in u, I am implicitly assuming, because u is a deleted neighborhood of c, that x does not equal c. If you want, for extra emphasis, you can go ahead and say that the distance between x and c is also greater than zero, but I don't really have to if I have the idea of a deleted neighborhood. But it doesn't hurt to write it. A second way you can write this second line is as an implication. You can write um, that if x is in u and the distance between x and c is less than delta, and again, x being in the deleted neighborhood u of c, which does not contain c, would implicitly would imply that x does not equal c. But if you want extra emphasis, go ahead and do that. This implies that the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon. That would be an alternative way of writing that second line. Either way is okay. On to problem number two. Let i, 
a subset of the real numbers be an interval, what kind of interval? Doesn't matter. Open interval, closed interval, half open, half closed, infinite, doesn't matter. And let C be a number in this interval. We want to define what it means for a function defined on I and having real values to be continuous at C. If I were closed, C could be an endpoint, and so in reality, this could be continuous just from one side, but we're fine thinking of this as being pure continuity at C in that case. All right. Essentially, what we, go, what we do here is we say that it fits the definition of a limit when L is the function value. And if that reminds me, I wanted to make a point of emphasis back in the first problem that we could define F to be at C to be something else other than L, and the limit would still be L. I forgot to mention that. But for continuity, we don't. We want to fill in that hole. Okay? So we want to have the L. We don't want to delete the neighborhood. We want I itself. So essentially, it's the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and state it as an epsilon delta definition, though I could state it in terms of the limit symbol here. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that the distance between f of x and not l, but f of c, f of c is l, is less than epsilon for all x in the interval such that now we don't need to emphasize that x has to be not equal to c. The distance between x and c is less than delta. x could equal c, then this distance would be zero. That's fine. It doesn't hurt anything. And we do want the function, in fact, to be defined at c for this to make sense. And once again, we can write this second line alternatively as an implication, x being an i and the distance between x and c being less than delta would both imply that the distance between f of x and f of c is less than epsilon. Effectively, the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals f of c, though again, if c is an endpoint, Really, this would be a one-sided limit, but it's fine just thinking of it this way. Number three, define what it means for a function f to be Riemann integrable on the closed interval from a to b. We are going to take this definition in terms of tagged partitions and Riemann sums. Other books take the approach of what are called upper and lower sums. We're going to use tag partitions and Riemann sums, and I'm going to initially, in stating the definition, I'm going to assume you know what those are, but then after I've stated the definition, I will remind you what those are. We're essentially trying to say, what does it mean for uh, the graph of f, say if it's above the axis, to have an area under its graph that is well defined? Intuitively, you're thinking in terms of trying to approximate the area by the sum of the, the areas of a bunch of rectangles, and you want the limiting values of those summations to get closer and closer to the true limiting, limiting value, the true integral value, which you could call L, say, as all the rectangles get skinnier and skinnier. That's the intuition. So here's how we go do it. There is going to be some value for the integral. It's Riemann integrable if there exists some value of the integral. I'm going to go ahead and call it L for limit. It is a real number such that for all epsilon greater than zero, epsilon, once again, is our measure of closeness. We want to get arbitrarily close to the true limiting value. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero. Now, we're not going to talk about distances between x values here. We are going to talk about a distance between L and Riemann sum values but not x values. It's not going to be the same thing as these things. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that the distance between an arbitrary Riemann sum for the function f relative to a certain tag partition, tp, and l can be made less than epsilon for all tag partitions of the interval such that what? Such that all the rectangles are sufficiently skinny. I should emphasize you should also, I'm also assuming you know what that means and you know what this symbol means. This is called the norm of the tag partition 
I want that to be less than delta. What this norm represents is the maximum width of any rectangle. When you learn calculus, you typically take the rectangles to all have the same width, but in the theory of Riemann integration in a real analysis, you want to allow yourself to have more general widths that all the rectangles don't have to have the same width, but this norm here is really the max width of all the rectangles. And I should have said in the problem state that I'm, statement that I'm assuming you know what that is as well. Max width of all the rectangles. Max width of all the subintervals of the entire interval from A to B. You can make the Riemann sum as close as you like to the integral value as long as your tag partition of the interval has norm less than delta. Okay, visually, we're breaking up the interval into a bunch of subintervals. That corresponds to a partition. A tagged partition just means you pick tags within each interval that are going to represent numbers that get plugged into the function to determine the heights of the approximating rectangles. So you plug a number into the function to get the height of the approximating rectangle on that interval. This is a little hard to see in my drawing, but that's the basic idea. Symbolically, in the textbook that I use, um, a tag partition is represented as a collection of, well, ordered pairs of tags and subintervals. You could write t sub 1 comma x0 comma x1. t sub 1 represents the first tag of the first interval. x sub 0 represents the left hand point A. x sub 1 is, say, this point right there. x sub 2 is going to be the next point, etc. The last value of x is going to be the right endpoint of the entire interval. And again, these t values are the tags. They are in each of the subintervals. That's assumed here. The last one is going to be tn. tn comma, the interval is going to be x sub n minus 1 to x sub n. And again, those tags, those t values that are in each interval are the numbers that you plug into the function. T1 might be right there, T2 would be right there to determine the heights of the approximating rectangles. The corresponding Riemann sum, 4F, relative to the tag partition, is the summation of the areas of all those rectangles. There's n of them, so you let i go from 1 to n. You plug the tags into F and you multiply times the width of each rectangle, which you could represent as the dif difference xi minus xi minus 1. Okay, so that's just all background in case you didn't know what a tag partition was, but I was assuming you know that, and this is the key definition that I was after. Number four, state the intermediate value theorem. Number five is state the extreme value theorem. These are the big theorems about continuity when you've got a function continuous on an entire closed interval, closed and bounded interval. This is these are the key theorems that you can prove based on that assumption. What does the intermediate value theorem say? It says if f, whose domain is, we're going to take it to be a closed interval, a closed and bounded interval from a to b, real valued, is continuous on that entire closed and bounded interval, that compact interval, hint, 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 if you've heard of the word compact, um, and if a number v is between the function outputs at the endpoints, f of a and f of b, if f of a happens to be less than f of b, then f of a would be less than v is less than f of b, but it could be the other way around. The conclusion is then there exists a number c actually in the open inter interval from a to b such that f of c equals v. That's the intermediate value theorem in a picture. a is here and b is there. Maybe your function looks like this. f of a is right here. f of b is right here. 
V is any number between them, say right there. There's at least one, maybe more than one, value of C between A and B such that F of C equals V. That's going to happen because the graph is continuous. It has no holes in it, no jumps. You can draw it without picking up your writing utensil. But to prove this requires ultimately the completeness axiom of the real number system. That is the intermediate value theorem. If f of a and equal to f of b, then there would be no v between them. So this is implicitly assuming we're in the case where f of a does not equal f of b. Number five, state the extreme value theorem. Same setup, if f is defined on a closed interval, is real valued, and is continuous on that closed interval, Then we can jump, jump right to the conclusion here. Um, essentially, f will attain a global maximum and a global minimum value outputs. The sup and inth, supremum and infimum, of the outputs of the function will exist, and f will attain those values as well. We can say it more simply as this. Then there exists two numbers, c and d, which could be endpoints of the interval. Back here, we can take C to be in the open interval from A to B, but here C and D, it could be one of the endpoints. There exists C and D in the interval from A to B, including the possibility of the endpoints, such that F of C is really the lowest possible value of the function on the interval, and F of D is the largest. This is gonna be true for all x in the closed interval from a to b. Yeah, that'll be the global min value. And this will be the global max value. The value, the number f of c, will be the inf of the set of all possible outputs of the function, the image. And f of d will be the soup of the image of the function, okay? The image of this function, this continuous function, is gonna be itself a closed and bounded interval. Okay, so you can actually generalize this. You could also talk about being compact. The image of a compact set under a continuous function is also compact. If you don't know what compact means, it's okay. We're actually gonna use the extreme value theorem to justify a calculation we do later here. Not at the moment. Next problem, define uniformly continuous on an interval. I is an interval. We have the definition for F to be uniformly continuous on I. By the way, we defined earlier continuity at a point C. I also could have defined continuity on an entire interval. I could have said F is continuous on I if it's continuous at every C in I. Uniform continuity is a more subtle concept, and I need to go back to an e epsilon delta definition, and I need to be careful how I state it. It's uniformly continuous on the entire interval I if for all epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small, I can make the outputs of the function within epsilon of each other when the inputs are within delta of each other for some delta, no matter what those inputs are, no matter what they are, they could be far apart even. Um, well, okay, they could, they're gonna be close together, delta is a measure of close together, but they can be anywhere. That's what I'm trying to say. The, the delta that you can pick is the same no matter where you are. That's the point, okay? For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that the distance between f of x and f of y can be made less than epsilon for all x comma y in the interval such that the distance between them is less than delta. Okay? <clears throat> Uniform continuity will imply continuity at every point. Uniform continuity over an interval will imply continuity at every point in the interval. But notice, the dis distinction here is this is true 
the same delta can be picked no matter what x and y are as long as they are sufficiently close together. That's the point, okay? Just because a function is continuous on an interval does not mean it's uniformly continuous. An example, this is a side comment here, is for example, f of x equals 1 over x, and i is the open interval from 0 to 1. Certainly 1 over x is continuous on the open interval from 0 to 1, but it turns out to not be uniformly continuous. The value of delta you would have to pick would depend on where you are in the interval. Graphing it might help you get some intuition about why that's the case. This is not uniformly continuous. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put an x through it, but you've seen what I meant. 7 says state the uniform continuity theorem. Um, this is a theorem that says some continuous functions on an inter interval are uniformly continuous on the interval. In fact, your examples that you come up with that are not uniformly continuous have to not be closed and bounded intervals, not compact intervals. This theorem says if f from a closed and bounded interval, a compact interval, to the real number line, it's a real valued function, is continuous on that entire closed and bounded interval, then it is also uniformly continuous on that closed and bounded interval. That's the uniform continuity theorem. If the interval were open, it would not be true. It would not be a true if-then statement. Even if the interval were half open, half closed, it would not be. If the interval were the entire real, real line, it would not be. It's got to be a closed and bounded interval. Number eight, state the mean value theorem. This is related to derivatives. I'm going to start by saying let f once again, have a domain that is a closed and bounded interval from A to B. Once again, real valued. And I'm going to let it be continuous on the entire closed interval and differentiable, having a derivative on the open interval then a certain conclusion can be reached relating the slope of a tangent line to a slope of a secant line. If the graph of f looks like this, say, the secant line in question is the line connecting the endpoints of the graph there's at least one spot on the graph where the slope of the tangent equals the slope of the secant. The derivative value is the same as the slope of the secant. Where would that be here? Well, maybe right about there. It has a tangent line whose slope is the same as the slope of the secant line. Call that C. The conclusion of the theorem is then there exists a C in the open interval from A to B such that f prime of c, the slope of the tangent line, equals f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a, the slope of the secant line between those two points. This also can be written as f of b minus f of a equals f prime of c times b minus a, and we're actually going to use that form of the conclusion for a proof later in this video. You might wonder, why not just assume it's differentiable on the entire closed interval where at the endpoints you're assuming just a one-sided derivative because differentiability implies continuity. And the reason is, well, because you can still get away with a slightly weaker hypothesis. You actually don't need differentiability at the endpoints. An example where that is relevant is if f of x is the um, inverse sine function or arc sine function. Those are the same thing. And the interval is the domain of definition 
which is the entire interval from negative 1 to 1, that function is continuous from negative 1 to 1, and it's differentiable on the open interval from negative 1 to 1, continuous on the closed one, but it's not differentiable at the endpoints. Its graph looks like this, and it's not differentiable at the endpoints, even though it's defined there and continuous there, because the slope approaches infinity. The slope of the tangent approaches infinity as you approach either endpoint. Um, that's why it fails to be differentiable at the endpoints. So the weaker hypothesis is good enough to prove the theorem, and it then applies to situations where you are not differentiable at the endpoints. And by the way, in this example, there are two spots where the slope of the tangent is the same as the slope of the secant. And I would, I would encourage you as an exercise to see if you can figure out where those spots are. Number nine, really a calculus problem, but I like putting a few calculus problems here and there in my real analysis exams. Let f of x equal x cubed. Use the definition of the derivative to confirm that f prime of x equals 3x squared. Show your steps. Okay, so this is really a calculus problem. By definition, the derivative of f at a number x is the limit as, say, h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Sometimes delta x is used instead of h, but it doesn't matter. Uh, h goes to 0. So now it's just a matter of computing this limit. It's a, it's a calculus problem. Plug in x plus h into x cubed, so you get x plus h quantity cubed. Plug in x into f, and you get x cubed. Just do some algebra now. Expand that with the binomial theorem, Pascal's triangle. You'll get x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed. Don't forget to subtract x cubed. And I hope you remember with these kinds of problems, what typically happens is you get complete cancellation of terms that don't involve h on top. And there you can therefore factor out the h of the remaining terms, leaving you with a 3x squared there, then a plus 3xh with the next term, and then a plus h squared with the next one. And then divide the h's out. and then calculate your limit. Now, I'm not giving reasons for these steps but I uh, initially here, but I will, and I'm not requiring it in the exam itself, but I will briefly tell you reasons for each step. After I finish it here, now we plug in h equals 0, and we get ultimately 3x squared. What are the reasons for each step? Real quick. First equality is just the definition of the derivative. Second equality is just using the formula for the function, substitution. Third equality is just algebra, expansion, which is ultimately based on the distributive property. More algebra to go from here to here. The key steps whose reasons are a little bit more mysterious are, you might say, this one and this one. This last one right there, well, that's not the very last one, that's just a calculation, but the second to last one right there is based on continuity of this function as a function of h. It's a continuous function of h, including at h equals 0, thinking of x as fixed. I can evaluate that limit as h goes to 0 by substituting in h equals 0 to get this. This is the trickiest step to justify. It really is based on the definition of a limit from the first problem on this exam where the deleted neighborhood idea is actually relevant here. This function right here, as a function of h when x is fixed, is undefined at h equals 0. And if you graphed it, say by picking a particular value of x, graph it as a function of h, technically speaking, its graph would have a hole in it at h equals 0, but the limit would exist. Why does the limit exist? Well, because this expression right here does equal this expression right there as long as h is not 0, because I canceled the h's. This one is defined when h is 0, and there's the limit. This one's undefined when h is 0, but they're equal when h is not 0, 
And therefore, if this one has a limit, which it does, this one will also have the same limit. Okay? So it's really based on the definition of a limit that allows me to say that there, and the fact that it doesn't matter what happens at h equals 0 for this function. It's defined in a deleted neighborhood of h equals 0. Number 10 is our second calculation question. The next page is some true-false questions, then another calculation, and then after that, it's all proofs. Suppose f and g are differentiable for all x, and suppose you know these facts. Let h of x be the composition, f of g of x, also written f circle g of x sometimes. Show work to find h prime of 3. I hope you know this is a calculus problem. It's just the chain rule. The chain rule would imply in general here that h prime of x being the composition of f with g, f being the outside function, g being the inside function, is the derivative of the outside function, f prime, evaluated at the inside function, g of x, times the derivative of the inside function, g prime of x. When I plug in x equals 3, that becomes f prime of g of 3 times g prime of 3. But g of 3 is given to be 5. And then we are also given the values of f prime of 5 and g prime of 3 to be 4 times 7. Ultimately, the answer is 28. Okay, You had to be given the right information to be able to do it but I did give the information you need. Some of the information is extraneous. So you don't need it. You don't need, for example, f of 5 equaling 2. It's irrelevant for the problem. Okay, I think I did that right. If I, By the way, if there's a make mistakes, I'll try to put a note on the video. I think that's good. Now we've got some true-false questions that are more theoretical, and then we also have a calculation at the bottom, another calculus problem, you might say. But these true-false questions are related to facts that you should know in real analysis. Number 11 says, true or false, there exists a monotone function defined in a closed interval from A to B and with real values whose set of discontinuities D equals the set of all irrational numbers in the interval. R take away Q, R set minus Q intersect the interval those are all the irrational numbers. If I intersect it with the interval, that's all the inter irrational numbers in the interval. Implicitly assuming here A is less than B. Is this true or false? Well, you got to know a fact, okay? Something everybody who takes real analysis should ultimately know. Monotone functions Continuous functions are examples of quote-unquote nice functions. Now, monotone functions don't have to be continuous. They can have discontinuities. They're going to be jump discontinuities. Turns out there's a theorem that says the set of discontinuities of such a monotone function has to be a countable set, which means either finite or countably infinite. However, the set of all irrational numbers in such an interval is uncountable. So the ideas of countability versus uncountability, and therefore this is false. Okay? Got that? It's just a fact to know. Next problem. If f is differentiable and monotone increasing on an interval, then f prime of x is greater than zero for all x in the interval. There is a theorem that says the converse of this is true, essentially. If you assume you've got a differentiable function and its derivative is always positive on the interval, then you can conclude that the function is monotone increasing on the interval. That's a consequence of the mean value theorem. It's sometimes called the increasing function theorem. But this fact, this statement, I should say, is false. It's not a fact. Can you come up with a counterexample? Counter yeah, the simplest counterexample that you should know is f of x equals x cubed, and i is any interval containing 0. Um, and I don't want 0 to be an endpoint. For, so for example, I can take the open interval from negative 1 to 1. f prime is not always positive because, well, f prime of 0 is 0 
which is not positive. Zero is not positive. Zero is not positive. It's also not negative. It's in, in its own class. Okay, so you might say it's barely false, but it's technically still false. Being barely false in math is enough to say it is definitely false. 13, if f is such a function again, and it's not bounded on the closed interval, then it is not Riemann integrable on that closed interval. This one's a bit confusing. This one is true because it's the contrapositive of a th commonly stated theorem that says if you've got such a function that's Riemann integrable on the closed interval, then it must be bounded on the closed interval. But if you think about that, and if you th think back to calculus, it's a little confusing because of the idea of an improper integral. This being true does not contradict the fact that an improper integral such as, oh, the improper integral from zero to one of one over square root of x exists. That is an improper integral. Notice it's undefined at zero. You can verify that if you think of this as a limit, as the lower endpoint a goes to zero from the right of the integral from a to one, of x to the negative one half, you can compute that, that limit and you will see it exists. It's the limit as a goes to zero from the right of the integral from a to one of x to the negative one half. That does exist. Check it out. But that does not mean this function is Riemann integrable on this interval. In fact, it's, it's not bounded. It's unbounded on the interval. Its graph goes off to infinity. It's not Riemann integrable. So why is this true? Well, it's true because there's a proof of it. Um, it's not false in a sense because it, th this example doesn't contradict the truth of it because improper integrals are a different animal. They're not related to the definition of Riemann integra integrability as we've given it, given it with tag partitions. Okay, they are limits of proper integrals. They themselves are not proper integrals. They are improper. Okay, so that's a bit confusing, but that, that is what the case is here. 14, true or false, there are real valued continuous functions on the interval from A to B that are not Riemann integrable. Um, that one contradicts a theorem. That one is false. Every such continuous function on the entire interval, if it's continuous on the entire interval, will be Riemann integrable. Continuous functions are nice. They are going to be Riemann integrable over closed and bounded intervals. 15, a real valued function that is monotone on the closed and bounded interval is also Riemann integrable. That's essentially a statement of theor a theorem that is true. I could have replaced monotone with continuous and it would be true. But in the previous problem, I was saying there's a continuous one that's not Riemann integrable, so it's false. 16, there exists a differentiable function f whose derivative f prime is not continuous on an interval, but it satisfies something called the intermediate value property on that interval. Now, you need to know what the intermediate value property is. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Essentially, it's, I'm claiming here, if this is true, that f prime, even though it's evidently got discontinuity somehow on some interval, it essentially is going to still satisfy the conclusion of the intermediate value theorem. If v is a value between f of a and f of b, on the a and b are, say, the endpoints of the interval, then there's going to be a value of c between a and b where f prime of c equals v. You just got to know this. This turns out to actually be true. It's a theorem. In spite of the fact that f prime is not continuous. What's an example of such a function? There exists such an example common example people give is this function, f of x is x squared times sine of 1 over x if x is not 0, and 0 if x is 0. And let's say your interval i goes from, well, maybe negative 1 to 1. This function oscillates because of the 1 over x inside the sine infinitely often 
above and below the x-axis on any tiny interval around zero, no matter how tiny, infinitely often. The x squared in front makes the um, amplitude of those oscillations get smaller and smaller pretty fast, but there's infinitely many of them. Here's zero right there, say. There's infinitely many oscillations on any tiny interval around zero. They get faster and faster in their oscillations. But the fact that the amplitude goes to zero fast enough turns out to mean that not only does the limit of this function is, exist as x goes to zero, and not only does that limit equal the function value, it's so the function is continuous at x equals zero, but also this function still turns out to be differentiable at zero. And the value of the derivative at zero turns out to equal zero. However, f prime turns out to not be continuous at zero. I encourage you to look into it to try finding f prime of x for all x, including at x equals zero and graph it, and what you're going to see is you're going to have infinitely many oscillations for f prime near zero as well, but I believe that the um, amplitude doesn't go to zero. Even though f prime of zero is zero, the amplitude of those infinitely many oscillations does not go to zero, and that's why you get that it's not continuous at zero. But be because it's oscillating infinitely often, that's with constant amplitude effectively, or I'm not positive it's a constant amplitude. Um, that's effectively why the intermediate value property still holds. 17. Calculus problem, and then we're on to proofs. Let f of x equal 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 36x plus 5. Show work to find the global maximum and minimum values outputs of f, which will be guaranteed to exist because f is continuous and the interval here is closed and bounded. Extreme value theorem guarantees that the global maximum values exist and identifying the values of x where these occur as well. I'm going to use a little more here, a technique based on another theorem related to critical points of functions. It turns out for such a function that is also differentiable on the interval that the global max and min values will occur either at the critical points in the interval or at the endpoints. Now the critical points are found by finding the derivative, setting it equal to zero, and solving for x. Critical points, it's a calculus problem. Critical points can also occur for non-polynomials where uh, the derivative does not exist. And you'd want to check the function values at the critical points and at the endpoints. So there's the derivative. Um, I can factor out a six like this. And then to, I want to set that equal to zero and solve for the for x to find the critical points of f. I can factor like this. I could also use the quadratic formula. So the critical points are at x equals negative three and positive two. No guarantee that those are going to be where the max and min occur. I need to check those and compare them with the endpoints. I do not need the first or second derivative test here. I'm not after local extrema. I'm after global extrema, which makes my work a little easier because I don't have to use the first or second derivative test. I mean, it's not that bad in this case to do that, but I need to plug in the values of the endpoints and the critical points into f. I need to find these four values and compare them. Okay. Um, did I let my students use a calculator on this test? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> um, I can partially do this in my head, I guess. Negative 5 cubed is um, <clears throat> negative 125 times 2 is negative 250. Negative 5 squared is 25 times 3 is 75. Minus 36 times negative 5 is going to be plus... Uh, I don't want to make a mistake here. Oops. 36 times 5 plus 180, plus 5, plus 75, minus 250. I'll put it there is 10. At negative 3, negative 3 cubes, negative 27 times 2 is negative 
54. Hopefully I don't make a mistake. Negative 3 squared is positive 9 times 3 is 27. Then plus, um, plus 108, plus 5. I hope I'm not making a mistake. That's a negative 27 there. Plus 113, 86. F of 2 is going to be 16 plus uh, 12 minus 72 plus 5. That's going to be a negative number. Let's see, 28 minus 67, negative 39. F of 5 is, I, can, I know what the graph this is going to look like. It's going to be back to positive here. 5 cubed. 125 times 2 is 250, plus 75, minus 180, plus 5. So we got uh, 325 minus 175, 150. So now you just look for the highest and lowest numbers. 150 is the highest. There's your global max value also called um, absolute max value, but I prefer global. There's your global min value. And the places where they occur are 2 and 5, and you could write words to describe that. Uh, the graph is going to look something like this over the interval. Something about like that is what the graph is going to look like. It's cubic with the positive leading coefficient. Yeah, not, not a perfect graph, but um, something like this. 2 is right here, and uh, negative 3 is right there. Okay, on to the proofs. Got five proofs to do. For sake of time, I'm not going to do the proofs as carefully as I would want my students to do. By the way, I'm, I'm doing a, an exam effectively that would be longer than I'd give my students doing more problems here. So I'm not going to be as careful to save some time as I would be wanting my students to be. I want them to write in sentences. I'm probably just going to be a little sloppy as far as the sentences go. Number 18 says, let f of x be x squared plus 4x minus 7. Use the epsilon delta definition of a limit. Problem 1 to show that's true. So there's your L and there's your C. We can believe this property by just plugging in C equals 3. This is a continuous function. 3 squared is 9 plus 12 is 21 minus 7 is 14. But we need the epsilon delta definition. We need practice with the epsilon delta definition. The epsilon delta definition is not really so much for simple examples like this. It's really more to prove abstract properties. And also, you might say, is useful just for really making sure you rigorously define what a limit is. Because lots of functions are weird, like the function that oscillates infinitely often. All right. So you'd want to do scratch work to help you figure this out. You want to make the distance between f of x and l. In this case, the distance between x squared plus 4x minus 7 and 14 as small as you like by taking x sufficiently close to 3. Make this less than epsilon if I choose x less than uh, the distance between x and 3 less than delta, where I've got to decide what delta should be based on the given epsilon. It's not an easy thing to do. So what we're hoping here, if we're going to have a chance of doing this, is we're hoping that I can write this expression in terms of the distance between x and 3, the absolute value of x minus 3. And yes, you can, because you can factor this quadratic as x plus 7 times x minus 3. And lo and behold, there, there's an x minus 3. That's the key thing that makes me happy here. This is good. The absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. So I can also write this. And so intuitively, I can make this small, less than epsilon, if I make this small, less than delta. 
I've got to still decide what delta is. But wait a minute, doesn't this part right there kind of throw a wrench in things? Doesn't this cause us trouble? It seems to, because we don't want it to, to depend on x really. However, without loss of generality, we can assume x is close enough to 3, say within one unit of 3, to make this thing bounded by some number. Without loss of generality, we could assume the distance between x and 3 is less than 1. In other words, x is between 2 and 4. And that will allow us to bound this expression here. A couple ways to think of it. You could do a little trickery and use the triangle inequality. You could write x plus 7 as x minus 3 plus 10. Then use the triangle inequality to write that like this. And then, since I'm assuming without less generality this is true, I could say this is less than 1 plus 10, 11. And ultimately replace that with an 11. And I want this to be less than epsilon. So effectively, that also means I need to choose x to be so close to 3 that the distance between x and 3 is less than epsilon over 11. In my proof, which I'm about to do now, I need to combine, in choosing delta, this fact with this fact. How do you do that? Well, first of all, I'll start off by saying let epsilon greater than zero be given. I'm trying to verify that this limit is true. It's really problem one, the definition of a limit. What's the deleted neighborhood here? Well, essentially, you could take the entire real line except for three. but. This function is defined at 3, so it, it's, it doesn't matter really. Let epsilon greater than 0 be given. Here's how you do it. Choose delta to be the smaller, the minimum, of 1 and epsilon over 11. Okay. Epsilon is a small number, you might be arguing, shouldn't epsilon over 11 be less than 1? Well, no, epsilon is an arbitrary given number. It could be big. I still want to be able to do the proof. If epsilon is bigger than 11, then the minimum here is 1. This is a positive number because epsilon is positive. It's worth noting that this means delta is less than or equal to 1 and delta is less than or equal to epsilon over 11. That's worth noting. By saying delta is the smaller of the two, then it's smaller than or equal to both of them. Um, now, let x in R satisfy the condition that its distance to 3 is less than delta. And I can go ahead and say x does not equal 3, though it's not a big deal for this problem because this function is continuous at 3. But it doesn't hurt to say this. And so because of the note, I can say that the distance between x and 3 is both less than 1 and less than epsilon over 11 because it's less than delta, and delta is less than or equal to both of those things because delta is the smaller of the two. That's going to be helpful. Then, now essentially just do your scratch work. Except don't put the word want there at the end. Then the distance between f of x and l, I guess I am writing sentences here, <laughs> which is x squared plus 4x minus 7 minus 14, which is x squared plus 4x plus or minus 21, which is the absolute value of x plus 7 times x minus 3. Oh, I really should have put in another step here. Um, okay, I, I won't bother. Put, I, I probably should have put the this kind of work here maybe in there. I'll do it along the way here. Maybe I should also say by the triangle inequality, because I am going to use the triangle inequality. 
for my students, that's good to know what to use at first, but you use the triangle inequality so much that you don't really have to mention it. Um, do the same work as up here. x plus 7 is x minus 3 plus 10. Now use the triangle inequality. Use the fact that the dis distance between x and 3 is less than 1 here. Don't use it there. But now use the fact that the distance between x and 3 is less than epsilon over 11. And by doing so, we get a nice epsilon at the end. Don't put the word want anymore. Now we say this is true. And that, that's it, QED. We have shown that given an arbitrary epsilon that's positive, we can find a positive delta so that if the distance between x and 3 is between 0 and delta, then the distance between f of x and l is ultimately less than epsilon. That's the point. All right, that's the first proof. On to the second proof. And here, yeah, I, I, I need to go quicker. So I'm just going to write the idea. I need to do that here. Let f be continuous on a closed interval and reevaluated, where a is less than b. This next sentence, I'm telling my students when I give this kind of problem, I'm telling them you may assume it's something that technically needs proof, but I'm saying go ahead and use it. You may assume the direct image j equals f of i, which is the set of all outputs of f as x ranges over the domain, this closed interval, closed and bounded interval, is a bounded set. That's something that can be proved when f is continuous. In fact, you can prove it with the extreme value theorem. In fact, we are trying to prove part of the extreme value theorem here, so that would be circular reasoning. So don't use the extreme value theorem to prove that. It's, there's a, there are other proofs you can give. Therefore, by the completeness axiom, the inf of this set exists as a real number. Prove that there exists a point C in the interval such that f of C equals alpha, and therefore this is true. f of C is the global minimum value of the function. It attains its global minimum value, which is the inf of the set of all outputs. Okay, again, you know, you wouldn't be able to probably do the proof of such a thing without doing some scratch work, but I want to save time for the rest of the exam here and, and just jump right to the proof without doing scratch work. It's not an easy proof. Um, it's not completely clear how to do it. You do need the fact that alpha is the inf of j, meaning it's the greatest lower bound of j. And what you want to do is you want to use that fact in kind of a little trick to construct a sequence of numbers, cn say, in the closed and bounded interval, which by the bolzano weierstrass theorem you will know has a convergent subsequence. And you want to choose the sequence in such a way that it's clear that the limiting value of the function as the subsequence approaches some number is alpha. And whatever the subsequences sequence approaches will be c. It's kind of confusing if you don't know much about subsequences and that kind of thing. So this is it's a it's a something you gotta get used to to, to see how to do this. For any natural number n, you can say that alpha is certainly less than alpha plus 1 over n. That's obviously true. Nothing fancy going on there. Since alpha is the inf of uh, j, the inf of the image f of i, in for this set, the set of outputs as the inputs range over i. And since the inf of a set is its greatest lower bound, anything bigger than the inf, like this thing, will be 
not a lower bound of the set because alpha is the greatest lower bound and this thing is greater than alpha. So it can't be a lower bound of the set. For each n, for all n in n, there exists a cn um, in the interval i such that what? I'm trying to say, you know, what is this set? It's the set of all outputs of f such that f of cn is between these two numbers. Should I put strict less thans or less than or equal to's? It could be a less than or equal to there. f of cn could equal alpha. But I want alpha plus 1 over n to not be, a, I'm saying it's not a lower bound of the set, so I really should have a strict inequality there. Note, because of this, f of cn must approach alpha as n goes to infinity. The limit of the f of cn values must be alpha. Okay? f of cn is a sequence that converges to alpha. That doesn't mean cn converges to anything. cn could be bouncing back and forth if the function f was weird enough. So cn may not be convergent, but it will have a convergent subsequence because the interval is a closed and bounded interval. The bolzano weierstrass theorem implies that there exists a subsequence, call it C sub P sub N of CN that converges. Sequences in closed inbound inter intervals converge, or excuse me, have convergent subsequences. I is a closed and bounded interval. Is closed and bounded, you could also say compact. And CN is a sequence of points in I. Whatever CPN converges to will be what C is. In fact, we can go ahead and say let C equal the limit as n goes to infinity of the subsequence c sub p sub n. Okay. Then we, we are trying to show f of c equals alpha. We haven't used the continuity of f anywhere yet, have we? Con continuity, other than the assumption we made requires the continuity. We do need it one more spot. We do need the continuity of f one more time here. We can replace C with the limit of the subsequence. And then the continuity of F on the interval is enough to say we can pull the limit sign out. F is continuous. Uh, it's got to be continuous on the entire interval because I don't know where these subsequence points are. So we got to have a broad assumption of continuity on the, on the entire interval to be able to apply it. f of c p n is a subsequence of f of c n. But f of c n converges to alpha, therefore the subsequence f of c p n also converges to alpha. Done. Okay. And so here I was a little looser with the sentences. It was still kind of sentences, but Okay, trying to go faster. Down to three more proofs. Carefully use the mean value theorem. Mean value theorem, okay, carefully, I'm not gonna be as careful. To prove this inequality is true for all positive x. You may assume you know the function defined by this expression is continuous and differentiable on any interval of the form zero to x where x is positive. And I probably should have also say and if you know it's derivative. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, although we'll, we'll calculate it in the process of doing the proof. <sighs> we should probably start by saying let x greater than zero be given. x is an arbitrary positive number. I'm trying to show this is true for all positive x, so give me an arbitrary positive x. Let f of t be the fifth root of 1 plus t. In other words, 1 plus t to the 1 fifth, which is continuous and differentiable on the interval from 0 to x. We know with derivative f prime of t equal to 1 fifth times 1 plus t to the negative 4 fifths times 1 by the chain rule, which you can also write as 1 over 5 times 1 plus t to the positive 4 fifths. It is continuous and differentiable on the entire interval. Also, it's differentiable on the open interval. Therefore, by the mean value theorem, mvt implies there exists a number c in the open interval from 0 to x such that f prime of c is the same, the slope of the tangent is the same as the slope of the secant, f of x minus f of 0 divided by x minus 0. a and b here are 0 and x. But I'm going to write that without a fraction. I'm going to say f of x minus f of 0 equals f prime of c times x minus 0. So I, I multiply both sides by x minus 0. All right. Let's tease out what this means. Therefore, what is f of x? Plug in t equals x. Therefore, I'll write it as a fifth root. The fifth root of 1 plus, a, uh, 1 plus x minus f of 0. What's f of 0 is 1 equals f prime of c. There's f prime. Replace t with c. 1 over 5 times 1 plus c to the 4 fifths times x minus 0, which is x. We're getting close to where we want to be. The thing that seems to be throwing us for a loop still, though, is this thing. But we can fix that. This is an equality here for some c between 0 and x. However, I want an inequality. I can just say this is true because c is positive, so 1 plus c is bigger than 1, so 1 over 1 plus c is less than 1, and 1 over 1 plus c to the 4 fifths power is also less than 1. <clears throat> 1 to the 4 fifths is also 1. I'm taking the 4 fifths power here. And that does it. We're done. x is arbitrary. So this is true for all such x, because x is arbitrary. OK, I proved the inequality right there. Got to get practice with these kinds of things to realize what to do. Twenty-one. Let's try the blue, blue pen. I don't think I've used that much. Let a real valued function f be differentiable on in the entire real line and its derivative be bounded on the entire real line. Use the mean value theorem again and in the epsilon del delta definition of uniform continuity to prove that f is uniformly continuous on the entire real number line. If the derivative is bounded, even though the domain is the entire real number line, f will be uniform and continuous on the entire real number line. Uh, do I, can I just jump to the proof here right away? Uh, I think so. Let's see. f prime bounded, there's my abbreviation of bounded, on r implies there exists a positive real number m such that the absolute value of f 
f prime is less than or equal to m for all real x. That's what bounded means. We're trying to show f is f, prime, f is uniformly continuous using the epsilon delta definition. Probably be good to now say let epsilon greater than zero be given. I could have switched these two sentences around. I could have put this one first and that one second. What you want to do, I mean, you're going to use the mean value theorem in kind of a similar way that we did on the last problem <coughs> without any fractions like that. Except you're going to have, instead of f of x minus f of 0, you'll have maybe an f of x minus f of y. And an f prime of c where c is between x and y and an x minus y there. And because you're going to have an f prime of c there, the m is going to come into play when you get your inequality. And you're going to want delta to be epsilon over m. Choose delta equal to epsilon over m, which is positive. Suppose you've got two numbers, x and y, that are real numbers, and the distance between them is small, less than delta, which is epsilon over m. Without less generality, say, I, maybe I should have written that initially, x is, say, less than, well, maybe I should do y is less than x. So I could get rid of the absolute value signs. Don't have to, though. The mean value theorem will imply there exists a c in the interval from y to x, the open interval, such that f of x minus f of y equals f prime of c times y mi uh, x minus y. Therefore, Um, the distance between f of x and f of y equals the absolute value of f prime of c times the absolute value of x minus y, which is less than m times delta, because that's less than or equal to m, and that's strictly less than delta. But delta equals epsilon over m. The m's cancel, leaving you with an epsilon done. So, I mean, you probably have to do scratch work to figure that out, but I'm trying to save some time here um, to get us on now to the very last problem. The last problem looks hard, but it's actually very easy when you know what to do. Let a, b, and k all be real numbers with a less than b, and suppose f of x is the constant function k for all x in the interval. So the graph of this might look like this, horizontal line at k. Use the definition of Riemann integrability to prove that f is Riemann integrable on the interval from a to b. Let's see if we can find and review that definition from page one. this part here, there exists a number L that's going to be the value of the integral, such that for all epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small, I can make the distance between the Riemann sum and L less than the epsilon, I can make them close together, as close as I like, by taking your tag partition to have a sufficiently small norm. The norm there is, again, the max width of all the rectangles. I got to apply that definition. So the first thing you should think of is like, what should L be? Well, L is going to be the area of this rectangle. L equals k times b minus a. That's what L is going to be. That'll equal the integral. I haven't proved that yet, but that's what it's going to be. In real analysis, you typically just write f without writing f of x dx or something like that for the value of the integral. 
This is going to be easy because the function being constant is going to turn out to t uh, imply that it doesn't matter what tag partition we use. All the values of the Riemann sums for any tag partition will be the same number, L, k times b minus a. That's what makes this easy. If I made this function even slightly more complicated, like had it be some other number when x is over here, say, c, the proving that it's Riemann integrable becomes a lot harder, a lot trickier. Very unpleasant. So this is as easy as it comes, and it's, in a sense, it's almost too easy because it, even slightly harder problems are slightly trickier looking problems end up being a lot harder. Anyway, we can go ahead and prove it. Let epsilon greater than zero be given and let L equal K times B minus A. I know what the answer is going to be, and that's important to know that. If I picked something different from L, I wouldn't be able to finish my proof. Let delta be any positive number. <laughs> um, I could let it equal 1 if I want something specific. But I could just phrase it as just be any positive number, and I guess I didn't have to write greater than zero if I do that. You usually cannot do this, okay? You usually have to pick delta to depend on epsilon, like we have already in other problems. And suppose you've got a tag partition whose norm is less than delta. then the Riemann sum of f corresponding to that tag partition, like back in the problem on the first page, is a sum like this. So it's looking hard. However, now comes the easy part. No matter what your tags are, f of ti is the same thing, k. And that k being a constant can be factored out of the summation. And then what you've got in the summation, and I'll go ahead and write it out to make it clear, is you've got x1 minus x0 plus x2 minus x1 plus x3 minus x2 plus dot dot dot, ultimately plus xn minus xn minus 1. And what happens here is everything except the x0 and the xn cancel. This x1 cancels with this x1. This x2 cancels with this x2 because the minus sign there. There's a minus sign. This x3 cancels with an x3 here, blah, blah, blah. This xn minus 1, negative, cancels with a plus x and n minus 1 over here that I didn't write. What you're left with in the end is k times xn minus x0, but xn is b and x0 is a, just like I drew in this picture, a is x0 and b is xn. I, I wrote it here and here. So it doesn't matter what your tag partition is. The Riemann sum ends up equaling the integral. Add up the areas of rectangles, you're going to get the area of the big rectangle, no matter how you partition it. So um, that means the distance between s, f, t, p, and l is the distance between k times b minus a and k times b minus a, which is 0, which is definitely less than the given positive epsilon. Done. QED. Fun, fun, fun. OK, just it's like this is just too easy, but again, they get a lot harder really quick. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.